Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagan Radian here at the Gaylord National Harbor Convention Center, where we're covering the Air Force Association's annual Air, Space, and Cyber Conference and Trade Show. Our coverage here is sponsored by L3 Technologies and Leonardo DRS. Earlier today, we met with Jeff Babione, the Vice President and General Manager of Lockheed Martin's F-35 Lightning II Fighter Program. Here's our interview. Jeff, thanks for the time. Oh, thanks. I really enjoy talking to you. Um, so let's uh, get a little bit of a program update. You guys are uh, now on Lot 10. You're negotiating a Lot 11 contract. Um, and you guys have been working to reduce the both the unit cost of the airplane, airplane and the cost uh, per flying hour. I know Admiral Winner, just like his predecessor Chris Bogdan, was focused on that, as well as each of the military services. Give us a little bit of an update uh, from your guys' perspective, where you are on that cost curve and, and breaking some of these um, um, cost uh, targets that you guys have been shooting at. Yeah, so Vigo, it's a really exciting time on the program. I mean, you look at it, we're just exploding on all what we call lines of business. So from production, sustainment, and development. And even though we're winding down development, delivering the 3F capability to the warfighter towards the end of this year, we're really starting to explode in the other areas. So you, you mentioned about production. Uh, we're finishing out deliveries of LRIP-9 this year. We're targeting 66 airplanes. We're right on track uh, to finish that up at the end of this year. And we're ramping to more than 90 airplanes next year. And what does that mean from a, a URF, or a unit recurring flyaway cost? You may recall uh, LRIP-10, uh, $93.4 million for an A model. I really see a trajectory that gets us to an $80 million A model by 2019, 2020, the end of LRIP 14. This block buy that we've been talking about with our JPO partners really is a key enabler there. And the industry has moved forward with some economic order quantity buying, allows us to purchase large amounts of material at a discounted rate. We're, we're doing real well with that. And then we're going to, uh, as you mentioned, continue to negotiate ERP 11. We should get our first offer from the JPO this week. And I'm really encouraged by the, the partnership that Admiral Winter has shown. And I'm very confident that we'll be able to wrap that up uh, towards the end of this year at the latest. And that would lead us into the block buy uh, sometime early next year. Um, but uh, the, some of these um, targets have been a little bit more optimistic, right? I mean, the Air Force was supposed to buy a lot more airplanes this year. We were looking at 46, I think, is the number of the... That, that folks are talking about now. What happens if you guys don't get up that cost curve? Because if I look at some of your original schedules, you guys were shooting to be around 150 airplanes, right. which would have had a much more demonstrable impact on that unit cost. Yeah, so you're right. Uh, the quantity matters. Uh, the more that we put into the system, the larger we can get economies of scale. And so we're continually going back and forth with not only the U.S. services, but the partners. And so when they give us excursions, we say, okay, well, if you do that, that has a certain amount effect on the, the URF of the airplane. Fortunately, we're starting to see Congress add additional airplanes. So for years, they were starting to take airplanes out of the program of record. Uh, we're kind of optimistic that we're seeing some of those airplanes come back. The partners have been all in on the block buy, so they've actually come in with their advanced uh, order quantity funding even ahead of the U.S. So uh, we have a very prescribed process that allows us to allocate, hey, if you reduce two, three, ten airplanes, we can tell them what that cost is. And, and it's really just, hey, if you're going to do this, here's the awareness about how that will affect the overall cost of the airplane. Um, you mentioned uh, international partners. Um, a lot of guys very excited about the airplane, but we yeah. were just over at DSCI. Um, big debate there are the kind of cuts um, that are likely to happen to the budget. The cabinet office is debating that at the moment. And F-35 is a big part right. of the portfolio. Um, it perhaps is exasperated, and I want to get your take on it, because the British account for each of the costs of these airplanes very differently than any of the other customer uh, nations do. Um, have you guys had any conversations with the Brits? And what can you do to work with them to, you know, if they change rate, quantity, slip, a lot of the discussion is what can be slipped, what can be delayed, not ultimately change that 138 goal. What are, what, how much wiggle room can you give an important customer like that to allow them to, to sort of encourage them to sort of stick with the program, but mitigate the kind of cost impact that, that would come with that, right? Because anytime you slip it, the cost is going to go up. Yeah, certainly the UK has been a, a tremendous partner from the very beginning. One of the tier one partners, really, they were the foundation customer for the B model that you know has turned out to be a great, great airplane. Uh, working with them, we've tried to 
provide them a context of those decisions as we were talking about earlier, if they decide to extend the buy or delay it, that will significantly increase the cost of purchasing their jets. So with things like the EOQ, we're trying to make this um, an opportunity space for them. So take advantage of what we're doing with economic order quantity, buy the airplanes now. They'll never get any cheaper than when we're in this maximum rate, maximum capacity. Uh, but at the same time, we recognize that it's going to be their decision, and we're there to partner with them to provide it at the lowest possible cost. I think there's additional things that industry can do to reduce the cost, and our commitment to them is to do everything we can. <laughs> Although some of your subcontractors have told me that they're about to turn into diamonds, given how much pressure they're <laughs> under, um, which could be an industry uh, on its own, Jeff. You guys might want to consider that. Uh, have to talk to the Skunk Works about a diamond factory. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, there are some some contractors that are on the razor's edge of of, of doing that, but in all seriousness, let me um, go to the, the lot negotiations. Uh, you guys are negotiating lot um, 11 now. Uh, lot 9, you guys had a little bit of heartburn because the government sort of unilaterally imposed that on you guys. On 10, the president of the United States got directly involved, or at that point, actually, the president-elect got, got involved and, and put a little bit of pressure, although pretty much everybody agrees that the program stayed almost exactly on track. It may have accelerated a little bit. Are you guys comfortable where are you guys going to be on, on Lot 11? I think we're in a great place. Um, you know, I think the things that happened with 9 and 10 are behind us. Uh, we were able to come to an equitable agreement on how to um, take advantage of some uh, different business rules going forward, and that allowed us to, to allow us to accept the LRIP 9 uh, unilateral. And uh, you know, President-elect Trump at the time helping us get to an agreement on LRIP 10. Uh, I really like where we're at with LRIP 11. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we're just going to be receiving our first offer here soon. And I just, I just sense a, a greater level of collaboration. So I'm very optimistic. Uh, I think the industry team has done a good job of bringing the price down. And that's at the end of the day is can we assure the U.S. services and our partners that we're providing a good value. And I think we're in a good place with that. Um, let me ask you um, two quick questions because I know you've got to go. Um, question number one is, one of the challenges of the program has been that you guys are always shooting for a full up, fully loaded cost, whether it's for a cost per flying hour or whether it's for the jet. And the Brits accommodate and account for that very differently. They don't just say unit flyaway, but there's a whole bunch of things that they add to that. To an extent, has the program been its worst enemy in folks not understanding the apples to apples, oranges to oranges comparisons that happen here when you know, it, it, the cost per flying hour is a very different calculation of yes. cost per flying hour. I mean, does that, in a sense, sort of work against you? Are you guys not doing a good enough job explaining that to folks out there? You know, that's actually an excellent point, because when we talk about URF, everybody understands that's an airplane on the ramp that comes with some equipment, and we're relatively apples to apples when I'm comparing it to any of the airplane in the world. Cost per flying hour, very, very different. Every service does it different, every country does it different, and the value is different to each uh, nation, each service. And it doesn't account for the capability. We're talking about a fifth gen airplane that transforms the way we will fly and fight. What is the value in that? And how do you translate that into cost per flying hour? We really should be talking about cost per mission and the effectiveness of the weapons system to do that mission any measure where we add that to F-35, it's going to win. But to your point, we're doing everything we can to reduce the cost per flying or cost per tail. Just like we did with the URS, there's many things that we can do to, re to reduce the cost to sustain the airplane. And my commitment to the services and to our partners is we're going to do everything. Our term we like to say is we're going to make this a fifth generation airplane at a fourth gen sustainment price. So we'll get rid of this comparison that says that F-35 is more expensive. I personally think we can make it less expensive than fourth generation airplanes. Um, what, how do you respond to folks who are looking at um, advances in sensor technology, uh, whether it's EOIR, uh, whether it's some radar frequency bands that say that come 2025, this stealth advantage that this jet has will be negated? Well, uh, way they've been saying this for more than a decade. And I think 
our adversaries attempt to try to get to stealth or get out of band so they can detect stealth continues to be a challenge. But as we've always done in the past, we'll continue and in, in innovate ways to counter those. So I have complete confidence in what industry can do and what our really government counterparts can do in their laboratories. I mean, I've seen some of the stuff we're doing by go, and it's amazing. Uh, I mean, stealth is important. It's a baseline now going forward, but it's not the only thing we have. I think stealth is safe for a long time. And it's something that you guys can retrofit on the airplane, so it's not like this is how it's built and that's what you're stuck with. Certainly with, from the sensor standpoint, that's why having that ditch in stealth platform is so important because then as you add that sensor technology, as long as you can adapt it to not uh, bloom the signature, you're going to be able to enhance that capability. And we really have that foundation on F-35 that we didn't have even on F-22. So it's really a great platform to be begin that building from. And But also skin panel wise, you can also make some modifications and changes over time as you need to do that. Well certainly, because as you may recall, the stealth technology is literally built into the skin. So as we manipulate that, if we have to change those geometries, we should be able to integrate whatever new sensor uh, that we need in the structure. Now, I can't let everybody go without seeing, now, the, the, every time anybody has ever seen an F-35 model for the last 20 years, it's been, it's been a naked model, and we have visions of pylons and things on it. But Jeff, behind you is the beast model of the airplane, isn't it? So what we're looking at here is the F-35 in beast mode. So you're looking at 22,000 pounds of weapons, 18,000 pounds external. So whether it be the first day of war where you're totally stealth and going in to take out the IADs and those SAMs, or the next day when you're in a much more pervasive environment, you can load this thing up and it becomes a bomb truck. No other fifth generation airplane can do that. That's why you want an F-35, either the first day of war or the next day. It's there to fly and fight and win. And are you range competitive with existing uh, aircraft, legacy aircraft, or are you going to be range superior with because you guys carry almost 18,000 pounds of gas inside, which is the same as the F-22. Right, so it actually has superior range in the stealth mode. So without the external pylons, it can carry the same weight and still go much farther than any fourth generation airplane in its class. And like this, you're still competitive with anything in the current generation. Absolutely. Jeff, thanks very much. It's always a pleasure. Best of luck on Appreciate the program. Appreciate it. Thank you.